Today, we're going to be talking about the strategy for planning out your MVP, right? MVPs are really critical into getting your product up off the ground. And they're one of those key components that you kind of use your whole product life cycle and leverage often. And if you don't plan it out properly, uh, it can be really catastrophic, right? Before we dive into it too much, we're going to talk a little bit about rock climbing. Now, rock climbing gets used a lot as a metaphor for either the founder's journey or a product journey, right? Products climbing up the mountain, there's, uh, there's dangers, there's trials and setbacks, but we don't really spend a lot of time about the preparation before the climb, having those kind of conversations or using that as a way, as like a metaphor for what we should be doing before we go and go build our product or our business. A few years ago, uh, this amazing documentary came out called Free Solo. Uh, Alex here uh, climbs El Capitan out in, in California. The thing is, is he did it with no ropes, hence the name Free Solo, right? Climbed the entire rock face, the tallest, one of the tallest rock faces in the, in the world uh, without any ropes. Um, and the thing that I thought was really interesting about it is he didn't just like wake up one day and be like, I'm going to go climb uh, this rock face without any ropes. I mean, he's a very accomplished climber. He's done a, a lot of amazing feats, but during this documentary, you kind of see this, his process for taking on such a monumental challenge. You know, he scopes out potential routes, uh, with a magnifying glass and telescope and kind of looks at what he could potentially do. Uh, he's making sure the weather is good for climbing. He plots out the routes he's going to do that he thinks he's going to take. He's going to set up boundaries and really constraints for each climb. And then he executes these climbs with ropes first to make sure that he understands what's the best possible route uh, for before he attempts the, the major climb there. In the interviews after the premiere, he really attributed his success to the planning and preparation that it took to do um, that actual climb. Uh, you know, without this planning, he could have really put himself in a precarious place, uh, somewhere very dangerous. And I think it's the same for products. Like if we don't spend the time to prepare for MVPs, we can, we can build things that nobody wants and um, can really put us into precarious places. So who am I? Uh, my name is Billy Sweetman. I'm the head of design here at Headway. I'm a product designer. I've been doing product design for a long time. Um, and one of my thing, my favorite things is really to help bring things to life, help bring uh, products to market and make things that customers actually want to use um, and not just build something because we think it's cool, right? We actually want to make something that's useful and, and, and makes a big impact. And that's why I believe MVPs are really important. You know, before we dive in too deep, I want to really talk about like, what is the goal of an MVP, right? MVP is minimal viable product. Um, sometimes you'll hear, hear MLP, minimal lovable product. I think those could be interchangeable. Um, but there's really these two quotes about MVPs that kind of like that I've read recently that have solidified my thinking about MVPs. This first one uh, from Addy, who's an engineer leader at Google, is the greatest skill one can develop is reducing the gap between idea and execution, right? We really want to uh, be able to build things quickly once we have the idea um, so that we can learn from it and really understand. And this next one uh, from Jeff, from the author of User Story Mapping, is the most expensive way to test your idea is to build production quality software, right? Production quality is very expensive. It's time intensive. It requires a, a lot of things. So if I think about these two things is how can we reduce the time from idea to execution and not build production quality software uh, so we can learn quickly? And that's kind of where MVPs, I think, are in that sweet spot, right? That's what we really want to do. We want to build the smallest thing to prove our hypothesis get customers on board. And there's a lot of different types of MP, MVPs. So we want to understand how we can prepare for those and find the right one, right? The goal for an MVP and not like a heavy MVP. And the difference here is a heavy MVP might be in an industry that has lots of, um, you know, like the healthcare industry. There might be different things that you have to do, different regulations that you have to go through. So we're kind of talking about standard MVPs, um, you know, so the goal really here is to build something within a couple of weeks, not months, right? We want to build something in a handful of weeks. We want to launch quickly. We want to get customers right away so we can talk to them, right? And then we want to measure and learn and iterate, right? So we want to launch, let the customers experience something realistic, and we want to 
understand and synthesize that data and then go on and build out our next one. So we want to do this quickly. We don't want to spend a lot of time in the build cycle itself. Uh, what's not an MVP uh, is seems kind of self-explanatory, but like if you're building just a whole bunch of features and you haven't really talked to anybody and you're just kind of like, hey, we're going to do this feature and this feature and this feature, and we've all been in that case, really not building an MVP because you're just building a bunch of pet features, right? MVP is, you know, we have a small hypothesis. We need to go test it out with actual people. We can't just say, well, this feature is something that we want because I think it's the right thing we should do, right? We want to test it out. It's not an actual hypothesis if we just go and build it out. There's a lot of classic MVPs, right? These are like, you know, the rock star MVPs, right? Air uh, B&B really started as just a way for designers to have a place to sleep during a design conference. So how can you find housing or places to stay because the hotels are booked up and it's, it's very expensive. They didn't have any way to do payment, right? There was no maps or anything. It was just a way to connect people to folks who have available rooms and things to stay with. Right. This is one that's very sought after. People really talk about this a lot. It's really a great MVP, right? They built this up and they put it up, I think, over the course of just a couple of days um, and got people using it. And that's kind of what's spun out Airbnb. Another one is Uber, right? In the beginning, Uber just connected riders to cabs and processed some payments. And that's about it. There was no live GPS or tracking or anything like that. It was it was pretty straightforward. Um, you can see the website in the back where you can like uh, book the cab now and do payments. You know, you can tell this is an old one because there's BlackBerry on there. Um, but it's really interesting. So they start out with just really small concept, got it out there. And Instagram, while initially was like a Foursquare, if everyone remembers Foursquare, uh, clone, the thing that really took off was the photo sharing part of it, right? So they doubled down. And this is kind of interesting because it shows that you can build a product and you can then start to see some indicators in your product and then they can build MVPs upon that. So then they really double down on the photos, build MVPs around photo sharing. And that's kind of what Instagram turned into now instead of this four square location check-in, right? So it's really um, a great story of how MVPs is a continual thing to do in your product as you're building it. So what are kind of the steps that we wanna take when we're thinking about MVPs? I think about this as sort of four major steps, right? We've got our, we want to scope our routes. Like what are the potential avenues that we can take? You know, check the climate. We want to plot those routes and set the boundaries, right? Those are the same things that Alex used to climb El Capitan and what he did for his test climbs and things like that. So how can we think about preparing for our MVP in that same mindset? First thing we want to do is scope our routes, right? We want to really understand the different types of MVPs. There's all kinds of different MVPs that we can do, that we can run, and they're all going to tell us different things from our customers, right? So we really want to understand those and really think about what are the difference between those. Now, this next screen, we're going to go over a couple of MP MVPs. The thing that we really want to understand is like certain MVPs are going to give us different levels of observation depth, like what you know, how much time or how close are we going to be to a customer and really see what they're doing. Um, and then some of them are going to have different hypothesis validation strength. Like what is the indicator like that we think the, or the level of commitment that that's going to provide? And all of these are going to be a little bit different, right? So these are kind of, I would say the top MVPs that you can run, right? We've got concierge over here, which is very high observation strength. You're spending time with a customer hand-on crafted experience, talking to them all the time. You might be taking them through the experience, um, but the validation is kind of low, right? Because you're doing it all for them. You know, it's pretty easy for them because you're doing a lot of that work for them. Wizard of Oz is similar as concierge, except for, you know, there might be an interface, but a human's doing something on the back end. This is pretty, um, Zappos is a great story, right? People bought shoes online and the founder of Zappos was going out and buying them in a store and then shipping them, right? So that's kind of a, a Wizard of Oz experience, right? We've got like sales where you sell it before it exists, low observation, we're not really seeing what customers are doing, but we have a high validation in care, right? People are actually paying money for something that doesn't exist yet. So it's interesting, people are, are all for that. Similar to the landing page, right? We're gonna do a fake door, we wanna gauge that interest. People can click on a product and then we say, hey, it's not, come, it's not here yet, right? So we can, um, gain really high observ or high observation on on uh, the validation, but really low on the on the user engagement there. 
Then we also have like explainer videos or piecemeal. Piecemeal is like a bunch of products stitched together, right? Wizard of Oz and piecemeal kind of can be hand in hand. So piecemeal, I might be using Zapier, Google Sheets, uh, uh, Typeform, and kind of connecting all these things together. And then single product uh, or single feature product, right? This is probably the most expensive thing we're going to do. We're going to build a single feature, but it's going to give us a good level balance of our observation and, and validation indicators there. All the MVPs, we're gonna have different metrics that we're gonna be able to, to track along, right? Concierge, we're gonna have some really nice qualitative observations. We're gonna sit there, we're gonna be with the customer. We're gonna maybe see what they're doing as, as we go through it. Uh, landing page, right? We can do demand testing and user behavior, right? The fake door is a really good indicator of like testing demand. Throw up a landing page in a day, market it out to a couple of folks and then see if people click, hey, I'm interested in this. Single product feature, this allows us to really niche down our target group and analyze feedback on the actual feature itself, right? So every one of these MVPs is gonna have some different metrics that we can we can really um, rely on and understand to use those is, the, is really important for um, choosing which one we wanna go with. There's a lot of great tools to build out MVPs, right? An MVP can be uh, a no-code product in Bubble or Flutterflow. An MVP can be a website built in you know, Webflow or Card or um, WordPress. Um, you can connect things like a Google Form to an Airtable with things like Zapier. Uh, an MVP could even be a Figma prototype, right? Just a, a mocked up prototype uh, that we wanna test out with some users there. So there's a lot of different tools that we can use to build out MVPs before uh, we go build out our actual product, right? And you might have an actual product and you wanna spin up something real quick in a no-code environment that is separate from the product itself. And that's something that you can do too. That's a really good strategy for when you're thinking about building MVPs within a product team, is not worrying about the actual product development side and your, your product design and maybe one developer is spinning up little no-code tests to see how those things function. This also helps if you have to white label MVPs because you can't share a brand. Another thing that we care a lot about when we're thinking about MVPs and we're just kind of like scoping out our route here is understanding our time and budget and resources, right? So we just mapped out sort of a burn rate chart here and you can see that in this burn rate chart, you know, maybe we spent a couple of months doing MVPs, right? Some real small ones, lightweight ones. We got some leading indicators. We got some data. We made some adjustments here. We um, go into the, uh, maybe there's a heavier MVP before we get into big product build, right? We need to understand. We got want to go up to bat as many times as we possibly can. So really understanding the commitment into those MVPs and how much time and effort we have into those is really good. And we want to do a lot of MVPs, right? We want to test out a lot of hypothesis or test a hypothesis and then iterate on that as we kind of go. So it's really important for us um, as we're thinking about how to scope out the MVPs we're gonna run. The next thing that we're gonna do is really check the climate, right? We wanna check the environment. We're not gonna go climb a rock face when it's raining, right? It's slippery, it's not gonna be great. We really wanna find that perfect weather. And we wanna do the same thing with our MVPs, but checking climate's a little bit different, right? We wanna talk to people. We want to talk to a lot of people. We want to do problem interviews. We want to interview potential customers. We want to listen for trends and conversations that we're having. Um, we don't want to ask people, hey, what do you think about this idea? We want to understand the problems that they're having and then let us think about the solutions that we have. Um, and there's a lot of different tools that we can do this for, do this with. I mean, you can always talk to friends and family. Uh, be wary about that because just like asking your mom if your artwork's good as a little kid, she's probably going to say yes, and your friends and family will tell you that too. So it's really good to talk to strangers. A uh, couple of tools that you can use for this is like Respondent. Respondent's a great way to talk to folks from different industries um, and just have interviews with them. You can use user testing or user brain if you have an MVP already built and you want to get folks um, to review those things or you know questionnaires. There's different survey tools, but we want to talk to our customers. We don't want to just build something because we think it's the right solution, right? We might be having a problem that we're experiencing and we think, hey, we can build a product off of this. We want to go find some other people just to validate our, our thinking there a little bit before we invest in building an MVP. Another great thing that we can do is map out our opportunities, right? We're not going to have a single 
opportunity when we start thinking about a problem space we want to work in. For example, let's say I want to build um, a product that helps communication for intramural sports teams, right? There might be other opportunities there that I'm not even thinking about. So we want to go through and start mapping some of those out, right? Uh, opportunity solution tree is a great way to do this, right? Teresa Torres kind of uh, coined this, and we want to think about like the desired outcome of our uh, our product, what are the opportunities in there? What are potential solutions? And then our experiments. And those experiments can be MVPs that we build or um, MVPs that we try to run and facilitate through there. This is a, a, an example from a, a Netflix opportunity tree, right? They want to increase watch, minutes watched, right? They want you to watch more TV. Some of the opportunities is I can't find anything to watch. I don't want to be distracted by anything extra. I like to binge watch my favorite shows. And then as you see, they kind of go down and they see some of the experiments that they can run. All right, well, I don't want to see commercials or hear commercials as an opportunity. And their commercial free sub or the ability to fast forward or they can mute commercials. And then underneath, you can see the experiments that are on. Hey, fake offer, 4% conversion rate or buffer feasibility, you know, reducing the response time or live prototype for muting commercials, 38% uh, percent cu customer complaints in there, right? And then you can take that data, you've tried it out, and now you can go try something else or try a different opportunity, right? And then you might spawn off a whole new opportunity tree based on the test that you've run here. This is really great, and this is something that you can do. You don't need to work with um, your developers or other designers. This is something that as like a founder, you can just start thinking about what are the different opportunities in the space. And you're going to hear these in the interviews that you're running because we're all going to do interviews before we start building things. While we're doing this, we also want to think about getting rid of those pet features, right? We talked to 10 customers and if none of them have the problem we're trying to solve, maybe it's time to pivot or maybe it's time to start thinking about some of those other opportunities that we saw. Um, we're really spending time defining the problem and the different potential solutions that our customers face. We love pet features, right? We think our ideas are always the greatest one. These are the best things that we can possibly do. But sometimes maybe nobody has that problem or they're solving it in a way and you might identify something else. So really using that opportunity tree to maybe cut out some pet features here um, is going to be really good going forward. Now, now we can start plotting our route. Right, so we can start thinking about building out our MVP and starting to lay some stuff out. We've talked to some folks. We've done an opportunity solution tree. We understand what MVP we're going to run. Now let's start planning for this. Right. First thing we want to do is we want to write a brief. Uh, we want to write our ideas down. Right. You can write it anywhere. It can be an Apple note. It can be a Notion. But we just want to write it down so we've got a all of our collected thoughts put into paper somewhere and so that we can see if we're changing things or modifications and we keep sort of a log of that idea evolution, right? So we want to put a brief together. And then we want to start thinking about maybe a service blueprint, right? Service blueprint is a really great tool, especially if you're doing a piecemeal or a concierge or a wizard of Oz and there's going to be different interactions because we want to understand who's responsible for what what interactions are the customer is going to have and we want to understand the entire life cycle of that MVP. This is an example of a MVP product blueprint. Um, so we have the customer experience right up at the top. We have front stage. These are interactions the customer might have with the team. And then we have our backstage, which are things that are happening sort of on the back end. And then our support process it might be automations and things like that. So for example, here uh, in the front stage, uh, our team is sending a welcome email manually maybe to somebody asking them to come check out this website. They go to the website. Once they go to the website, we can retarget them with maybe some Google ads. Then customer might be signing up to get those uh, customized product catalog. Then their email gets added to our CRM, MailChimp, right? We start to unpack out the different steps of our experience in this service blueprint. And really understand how all these different things work and how they interconnect. This is something that we can do right away before we even start building anything. We can kind of map this out. Another thing, my personal favorite, is the app map, right? So let's say we are building a single featured prototype or, you know, I, this could work as well for um, a piecemeal solution where we're connecting multiple things. But this is really understanding how does our product 
connect itself. So for example, if this is a single feature prototype, uh, we want to understand what are the different screens that are going to be there? What is some of the data that's going to show up on there? How do I connect or filter and sort? And what are the different interactions I can do, right? This is something that you can do right away when you're thinking about your MVP, start mapping this out, right? You don't even have to have a team involved. You can start to think through and sort of imagine yourself using this experience. And this is going to save a ton of time when you get into building your MVP or talking to your design or your developer um, or building it yourself. You've kind of mapped out all the different scenarios, all the different data structures and things like that in this app map. And this is super, super helpful for really hitting the ground running there. The last thing that we want to do is really like set our boundaries, right? We want to think about how can we build the smallest thing possible uh, that's going to validate our hypothesis, right? And one of those things is cutting features, right? A lot of times we think, well, we need to have all these features to have a successful MVP. A lot of times that's not true. So we want to think about cutting features. I'm not going to harp on this too much because we kind of talked about it before, but like we want to reduce features down um, pretty small if we can. Just kidding. We're going to talk about cutting features. Too many MVPs have too many features. A lot of times they don't get used, right? We really want to build a single feature if we can and make it as effective as possible. The next thing we do is talk about the Moscow process, right? So maybe we've cut some features or we haven't yet, and we're going to use the Moscow process to, to really walk through that as a whole. Because a lot of times when we work with founders, we'll have lots of different ideas and lots of different features in their list. And we'll go through this process to really hone in on what's the thing that we should be building or what's the thing that makes the most sense. Now, uh, Moscow stands for uh, must have. So things that we absolutely have, we can't live without this feature. We need to have this to ship. Uh, we really have to challenge ourselves in this space. When we're talking about the must haves, we really, really need to challenge like, is this an absolute need? Um, the product doesn't mean anything without this, right? We can't live without this feature. Should have our items that are a little bit less important, but we should we probably need this, right? We need this uh, for our MVP um, or our product to be successful. And then could have, it'd be nice if we could get this and then won't have, there are things that are just not happening. We're taking those completely off the table. Um, these are extra interactions that we can ship in a V2 or in the next MVP, we can think about adding that in there. So we really want to go through this process. And some of the tools that I recommend doing this in is right in your service blueprint or your app map. So here is an actual app map that we've done where we went through and we did the Moscow process. And then from here, if you're actually building out an MVP, we can uh, translate this into a user story map. So this is just another view of a Moscow process. So for an MVP, we might have done that in the app map and then hand it off to our development team and they might turn into this where they can cut out MVP feature and get that up and running. And then after that, we're just going to execute and iterate, right? We're going to take those steps and now it's time to build our MVP, get it out there in front of people and iterate through it, right? It's hard to learn from customers when we don't have anything for them to use or play with, right? We need to get things out in front of customers. We can live in our heads and we can assume best case scenarios, but we need customers to use things. And we don't just want to wing it, right? We can wing it and that can turn into feature scope uh, issues. We can turn into missed timelines. We want to spend some time planning and preparing for this execution. And it's not a one-time deal, right? We want to keep doing this. We want to keep thinking about MVPs as we're going through our uh, our products, we want to, when we're kicking off a new business, we want to think about MVPs. We want to keep doing it, keep trying this out because we're really measuring and learning from our customers here. Once you're an established product, like building MVPs along the way and trying new ideas and concepts with our customer is super effective way to find out what features are the right things to build, right? You can build in these sort of safe environments and there's not a lot of risk involved because if an MVP doesn't trigger, you didn't invest all that time and money into that feature for something that nobody wants and nobody um, is going to use. Uh, we kind of have a, a, a saying here that like the most effective feedback is from customers who are actually paying for products, right? You know, a lot of feedback will lead into, will give you some leading indicators. But once you start asking people to put a credit card down, you know, the sentiment, sentiment's going to change a little bit. It's a transaction now. And so the feedback's going to be a lot more accurate. It's going to be a lot more punchier. Uh, people will be more truthful with you uh, when we do that. So one of the things that we recommend a lot is thinking about MVPs in that mindset. How can I get something to customers where they need to pay for it or it's part of a paying service right away so that we can really get that super, super accurate feedback uh, and really understand how people feel. 
And don't fall in love with your MVPs. You know, we really want to be realistic with what we're building. Some MVPs get thrown away. Some of them are hypothesis that we thought was going to be a good thing. Maybe some customers talked about it, but then we asked them to pay for it. And they said, ah, we don't want this anymore. Right. So the sentiment changes or we might have different requirements that come out. We want to get in the practice of building MVPs, but we want we don't want to be beholden to say this is the thing that we are absolutely endeared with or enamored with. Right. It's something that we can throw away. It can it's like a rough sketch. Right. We got an idea out. We tested it. But the important thing is we want to document what worked and what didn't work in that MVP. What is the learnings coming out of that? And how is that going to inform our next MVP that we go forward with? Right? We want to make sure we have a repository where we can actually document and bring back those learnings, right? So whether this is in, in Notion or in a FigJam board, we want to have a space where we're keeping track of, hey, this is the experiment we ran. This is the data we gathered from it. This is what we learned. This is what we're not going to do next. In it. This is the sentiment that came out of it. And sometimes you might learn something in a specific MVP that's going to spawn out a new MVP that you're going to think of right there, then and there. So that's one of the beauties of this is it not only can uncover new opportunities in the problem space that you're working in, um, but it can also help hone in and refine some of those opportunities you're already working in. We don't want to stop building MVPs, right? Just like the testing and plotting of the routes that Alex did for El Capitan, uh, he took different routes and some of them didn't work and some of them worked, uh, but he tested it with the safety of the rope. He didn't have to do it all, you know, without a rope or it could have been very dangerous. And we shouldn't be doing that with our MVPs or our products or our businesses either. We want to play in that safe space, have those opportunities to, to learn from our customers in a space that isn't going to ruin budgets, timelines, or really uh, put us in precarious situations. So we have a little bit of time for questions and answers uh, or some Q&A. Yeah. Uh, Samuel just had a question. Uh, what is your advice for a company that has gone past ideation stage but is struggling with getting funds to build their MVP? I think there's always that budget conversation, right? We're trying to build product and we're trying to get features out the door and sometimes companies can in and startups can fall into the we're just going to keep building features right we might not be doing research maybe we are doing some research um, but we need to get these out the out the door and we're not necessarily building out small mvps for that ahead of time and i think the conversation needs to come down to is like what is the smallest mvp we can do to maybe test a hypothesis and the smallest amount of cost right like are you willing to spend I'm just spitball here. Are you willing to spend $10,000 to save yourself from losing $100,000 because you built something nobody wants, right? How can you relate that to some sort of business metric, right? Cost is always a great one that you can talk about. So like, how can we spend a little bit of money to learn something um, and to iterate on something, you know, a new feature uh, that we want to run out or something like that uh, before we commit all of our time, effort, and resources into making that thing? Um and I know that's a hard conversation to have because we're not always thinking in that mindset. Um, but I think if you can relate it to an actual business metric, like cost, burn rate, things like that, you know, that's probably the way I would approach that conversation with my stakeholders. Uh, how is AI going to change process to create an MVP? It's going to make it faster. It is going to make MVPs uh, faster, quicker, we can spend, and, and you know, hopefully this will help with the previous question of getting funds, right? Um, for example, Reloom has a tool now where you can put a site map together and then it'll generate a, a site for you in Webflow and then you just have to go and style it and, and add some copy, right? So now you can build a site quicker, landing pages faster, right? We can learn quicker. I think AI is going to empower us to learn, learn things and try out MVPs quicker and less expense, you know, like in a dream scenario, can we ship a white labeled feature MVP in like three days instead of two to three weeks? Like that'd be fantastic, right? Then we can test, we can learn, we can iterate on that without spending a ton of money. So I think AI is just going to make things go faster um, as, as we, as it gets better and as it gets smarter um, and as more generative tools start showing up. I, and I think the interesting part of that conversation is like, how does it get used? Because you have like, because you, you, there's there's different aspects of uh, of the MVP process. So it's like, how do I use AI in 
crafting how I talk about this product, right? How do I use mm-hmm. AI to mock up different um, user interface in- options or different wireframes that I could mock up? Um, and then even as a developer, like how can I use um, uh, AI tools um, or there's a, what's the, like the co-pilot and all that kind of stuff with AI to write code faster or to just like give me a baseline of code that I, is you know dangerous enough to test this thing before we have a, another developer or more developers go through and polish this to be a high functioning like production ready thing right so yep. like um I, I think that's the thing is like finding where it fits in your in the process that you have as a team or by yourself like how can i leverage ai for a different aspect of a process that again makes you dangerous enough to test it with with real customers um i think is the interesting part and there's lots of great tools coming out it's hard to like filter through all the ai tools that are coming yeah. out like every week every day like or new updates like to a tool where it finally is like good enough to like actually use because right now i feel like we're in this like experimental world of using ai and it's funny because I, I i think um I always, I think when people say AI powered software and stuff, I think when people say, oh, I'm building an AI company, it's like, it's all software, like, like language models. It's all just, it's still using code. Mm -hmm. Like they're just, AI is just like the term for how the code is being used and leveraged. Right. So at the end of the day, you're still making software. It's just leveraging, you know, language models, uh, to, to, to do it more effectively or to do it at at a scale. So it's like, uh, but if you can't sell it without the word AI included in your product, I think that like it's not sellable anyway. Because I think the word AI is going to just be normal, right? Like uh, no one's going to care that it has AI because everything has AI at some point, right? Like it yeah. won't even it won't yeah. even like right now we're in a phase of like you throwing slapping that on and it sounds interesting and new. But give it five years, like well, if it doesn't have AI, like why why doesn't it have AI, <laughs> right? It's like that's kind of where we're going to be at. So. Yeah, and I think like in the utilization of AI for MVPs, like a perfect example I can think of right now is like, hey, I'm going to do a fake door landing page and I want to test like five different types of messaging. I could use AI to help me craft that messaging quickly throughout a day instead of spending multiple days workshopping text and dialogue. And I can spin that up. I can spin up multiple pages and then run ad campaigns to those pages and see which one converts the best. And that... You know, that's something that you can do right now uh, and today. So and that normally would have taken a lot of time to do. Um, So I think, yeah, we're just going to be able to iterate and build things quicker um, and build MVPs faster uh, before we start building out, you know, the real the real deal. Yeah, I I think uh, something that might be an interesting talk in the near future is like about the AI tools that exist today and how they can be leveraged for something like an MVP process. Like we were saying, Hey, spin up a landing page. Cause I still think communicating the fact that like, yeah, you can use this tool today, but you also have to have human intervention to say, Hey, it'll give you this really rough draft. And then you can go in yeah. and still like use AI to like improve the copywriting and the messaging and the positioning of your product through like these customer interviews and the research that you're doing, all that kind of stuff to figure out like, what are the pain points? Um, and are we clearly saying, saying that on the landing page or uh, improving the user experience messaging within, within like the MVP that you built too? Like there's, there's a lot of different ways you can do that, but the human intervention is still there to kind of do like quality check. Like, does this really make sense or what the AI put together or does it actually resonate with people and all that kind of stuff? So that might be kind of a fun thing to think through specific aspects of, the MVP process or just landing pages and pre-selling and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it'd be kind of fun to, to go through and just talk about what's out there and what's, what's possible. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. What do you think about building a visual interactive MVP that's not functional? Think about a prototype instead of investing actual development of the MVP. Uh, I think these are great tests, right? So when we talked a little bit about maybe doing a white label no code tool or a Figma prototype for an MVP, um, I think that's really safe space to to build out something small, scrappy, to test certain things out. I think uh, Figma prototypes are, especially now with some of the prototyping tools and variables, you can make it feel a lot more realistic than, uh, uh, than you could uh, even a year ago. Uh, so I think Figma prototypes are a great way to test are people interested in that? And we've seen uh, landing pages that lead to a Figma prototype where people kind of click through and then maybe do a form afterwards. So I think that's a, a super solid way to test things. Um, I think no code is something that um, designers can start 
getting into a little bit as well, uh, where they can start building out, you know, using bubble or something to build out and prototype some, uh, concepts and ideas in there as well. Um, I think, you know, with the way Figma prototypes are and no code tools, we are allowing, um, designers and non-technical folks, uh, so not developers, um, more opportunities to build, uh, MVPs and products to go go test ideas with. So I think those are absolutely a great way to test stuff out. Um, with that being said, you know, like the one thing with Figma prototypes is like, you know, they're not real. So it'll give us a good indication of what people are thinking and where they're going and what features there that are in there. Same thing with no code. If we're just spinning up a quick no code app, um, you know, it'll give us that good leading indicator uh, on where we're going. So that's just something to think about when we're building out those MVPs. Yeah, great question. The one thing when you're testing these prototypes too, um, you know, when you ask these questions, like, you know, if you start to get into like pricing questions, like, you know, how much would you probably pay for something like this or whatever? The one thing that Andrew's going to talk through on uh, uh, tomorrow is about the idea of like, especially when it's like a B2B product, when you're dealing with more, you know, like maybe enterprise type customers, um, larger scale, uh, co- like higher scale, higher cost type products, um, is that like when when people say, yeah, I'd probably pay this much or whatever, but like when they actually say, yeah, I will put down this much money right now to be one of your first customers because this problem's big enough for me to like, I want to be like the first person to try it out and leverage it. Because um, there's you can get this false positive you know, feedback of like, oh yeah, I would do that. I would do this. But until like they give you the credit card information or a check of some sort, like a, a note that they're like, that they're promising to pay you when it's, when it's, when this product is usable. Um, like it, again, you get like this false positive, like, you know, it's like your friend saying like, oh yeah, I would totally use that or whatever. And, and, and strangers will say that to you too. Like, oh yeah, I would, I could see myself using that. Like, so they'll say words like that, but it gives you this like false sense of hope that like people will actually pay for it. And the real signal is like, will people pay for this thing? Like, are they giving you the credit card information to put a hold and be like a first customer? Um, and so those early customers are really create that huge signal of like, is someone willing to pay you to like actually bring this idea to life and and will use it? Um, so, and it's easier said than done to do that. And it is a process, mm-hmm. but Andrew will be kind of walking through getting your first customers, your first paying customers and what that, what that process and how do you start? Where do you start? What does that process look like? So um, and your Figma prototype with a Stripe page. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Sign up again, now. Because, you know, the, I think the, there's been a lot of conversation around, like, Product Hunt and, like, how people put stuff on Product Hunt and they'll get, like, all, you know, all this, like, attention. But, like, none of these people would actually buy this product. Like, oh, that's, that's so cool, like, blah, blah, blah. But, like, yep. in, in a practical world, like, when you, like, go come down to it, like, well, I already have a workflow and I don't want to change what I'm doing right now. Like, I wouldn't, like, it's really cool. Like, oh, maybe I would use it someday or I would try mm-hmm. it out. But, like, the the idea of changing your habit, your daily habit or your current workflow is, like, such a huge ask for people. And so, like, that's where it's, like, is your product really going to be something that's worth their time and energy to change how they work and they're willing to pay for it? Like, and, and you know, it goes back to the whole thing of, like, you know, 90% of startups after a few years are no longer around. Um, and it's because like they haven't figured it out like that. What's that, you know, whether it's product market fit or, you know, salute, what is this? Is it the right solution for the, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it's a different audience instead, like, you know, whatever that fit is, like you're trying to figure out because there's so many companies that start where they think there were solutions for one, one problem or audience. And they realize it's for a different problem, different yep. audience or different problem, same audience. Right, like it, like figuring out where that fit is in that in that complexity of of, dyna- of the variables that you're dealing with when you're trying to figure out like how to sell, who to sell to, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's part of the journey. But again, I, like places like Product Hunt, um, they give such a, again that false positive. Like, well, look, it's got like a thousand upvotes or whatever, or like look at how much how many comments it has, and it's like, but no one's paying for it. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't. That's not a bit. Like we were, I was talking to someone this morning about it, like. You want to build a business, not just a, an app or a piece of software. Like you, like it does it create money? <laughs> like it's like, will it pay the bills? And so you can hire people and keep it growing and, and running and scale it. You know, um, or is it just like an interesting idea? Like you know, if it's if you're paying to keep it alive, that you know, John was saying that's a hobby. Like that's a hobby soft. That's just hobby. Yeah. 
hobby time. Like you're just doing this thing and it's like draining your pocket. But if you enjoy it, cool. And it's like, you're scratching your own itch. But if it's not building a business, like that's really what it comes down to. And, the, and unfortunately the harsh truth, um, but that's, that's the name of the game. Everybody, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we hopefully you can join us tomorrow and uh, feel free to subscribe to our channel. We have a ton of YouTube videos. We have like, and I think there were over 800,000 views on the channel, um, which has been pretty cool to just see all the, all the people that leave comments and uh, feedback. So if, if you watch any of our videos, leave a comment with a question. Um, we'll reply back to you as soon as we can, uh, usually within a day or within a week, just depending on the, on the time. Uh, but uh, we always want your feedback and we'd love to know like what videos you'd like to see from us. So um, until next time, take care and uh, see you next time. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.